Just like somebody had this planned out through the MCU, that the Bible is actually very clear about that God has your entire life already planned, planned out, right? That he knows what you're doing now, he knows what you're doing next year, and he knows the day you died just like he knew the day you were born, right? And so what we see here is just like this MCU, I was thinking like, how much more so is it where this little moment built this little moment that built this little moment and before we know this massive Avengers Endgame thing was built? Well, our lives are the same exact way as we walk through the Bible. We see that little moments build, build big stories. That we see that God, just like the MCU, of, I never thought that when they were doing this five years later it would lead to this. Just like in that same way is that's the God we serve. Is that, and we look to, is that... Is the same way is that he's building a story. Is that your life is a story. The Bible actually refers to it as a poem, handwritten by God, as David would call it. 
that just like this movie that's so amazing and so awesome that it's already been planned out is your life is the same exact way, right? That your life in every little moment that is there has already been built out and that many moments put together make a story, right? Just like these many movies put together made what became Avengers Endgame is at the end of your life, what you'll see is, and this is why when you look back on your life and you see events that led to certain events, you never see it in the present, but when you look back on it, what you realize is, is you're in the middle of a massive story. And you never even realized it at the time. I didn't realize it when I saw Iron Man 1, Iron Man 2, Captain America, Captain Marvel. Wasn't that good. But as I sat there, I was like, I was like, I never thought this was being built. And I couldn't help but think back on my life. Where when you look back on it, what's surrounded by confusion now, when we look back on it, it's so clear. And why is that? It's because it's a story. That our lives are not left up to chance. That it's truly not that God has never been surprised. He knows exactly what your life's going to be like. The mistake you made last night did not change anything. He knew you were going to make it. He's known it for ever. And so that's this thing that we sit in is that we realize that we are sitting in the middle of this story that upon looking back, just like when I look at it, Iron Man and Captain America and I'm seeing this massive story being built, I look back on my life and I see the same exact thing. If God was doing this, he was leading me here, he was taking this away so that he could do this. And if you don't realize that, I would challenge you tonight to see that, that your life really is a story, that it's not left up to chance, that you don't decide to change something that God already knows. And why the first point being tonight is that you realize that God is sovereign over your story. It's just like in your life and just like in what you're doing of when we saw this massive thing being built. It's God said, hey, that's a lot like your life. That's a lot like your life that I'm going to use these moments and these things that you don't understand and you don't know why it's happening. But it takes the pressure off because what we see is we're not meant to understand this story because we're not the ones who wrote it is that we're rather meant to trust in this story as his sovereignty reigns over it, that he's working, if we're his child, he's working all things for our good. And he's a father who doesn't need to ask the opinion of his children because he's wiser than you are. And so we see that in life, when we're a child of God, this is why Jesus says, calls us, uh, the shepherd, because the shepherd would lead the sheep where it needs to go, even when the sheep didn't know this. And so this is what we see, that the picture of God and of Jesus is he wants to, us to see is that what calms us in this life is that if we're a child of God, the story's not on us anymore. It's that we're walking into something that God has already pre-planned, right? That everything is predestined. That it's already meant to happen and we walk in this and that's why the Bible doesn't call us a lot of times to understand the will of God but rather to trust the will of God because simply put as Isaiah 55 says you won't understand the will of God his ways and his thoughts that you can't comprehend it because you're not meant to is that God is sovereign over your story I as I sat in Iron Man, I really enjoyed it, but I never thought that this was leading me somewhere. I didn't think that little old Iron Man was leading to something as massive as Avengers Endgame, and your life is the same exact way. It's that the moment and the thing that you're walking in right now is the very thing that leads you to where you're supposed to be. And that breeds a lot of calming, right? That allows us to rest in that we serve a God who's in control and we're his children so he works all things for our good and so we see this that someone in scripture actually had been walking with God and he's faced with a moment of he's been promised something he's been promised to be the king over all of Israel right this massive thing to lead God's nation but what we see here is the path to the palace doesn't look like what he thought it would right he doesn't move straight from from tending to the sheep, and we're talking about David, is to move there, but rather his life takes a complete 180. God, how in the world can I be called to 
to be uh, the king when the king is chasing me, when I'm hiding out, that David was on the run, that the king was trying to kill him. So God, my path, how can I trust you with it? It seems like if I'm honest, you're not fulfilling what you said you would. But he just didn't realize exactly what was going on. And we're going to be looking at probably one of the most famous scriptures that are in the Bible, and one of the most famous ancient literature that has ever existed, and it's Psalms 23. But we're going to be looking at it uh, from maybe a way we've never thought. So beginning in verse 1 with Psalms 23, it says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so, what we see here is that what David's looking at is that he gives this imagery when he's writing this. That it's in the middle of my journey, in the middle of my path. It's almost as if you've set a table before me. And when I don't understand where I'm at, you're causing me to sit and to rest and to trust in who you are. That when I don't understand what's going on around me, I can trust who's above me. And I can say, okay, God, this story is in your hands. I, I don't know what's going on. You call me to be king, but I'm hiding out in a cave somewhere. How is this... God, it, it doesn't seem like you're really fulfilling. But God says, you just don't understand how I'm carrying you there. And so this is what God says is that God's provision in our life looks a lot of what we don't expect, we don't think, and we don't want. So tonight, I've got my own little table. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping David's was a little bit nicer. Uh, but <coughs> no, tonight is... We're going to be looking at the three things that I believe God says is going to feed us, right? Because when you sit at a table, you're sitting there to rest and to eat, right? And you're sitting there, what do you do when you eat? You grow. And God's saying there's three things that I'm going to feed you with in this life that I'm going to cause you to grow. And you're meant to sit and to rest, right? That your soul in the middle of the shadow of death, in the middle of everything going on around you is that your soul can be at ease because he prepares a table not in the absence of my enemies but in the presence of them. And so one of the things we're going to be looking at tonight that feeds us that maybe you don't really think about but I think the Bible's very clear about is pain. Is that one of the things that actually feeds the believer in this life that the Bible does not shy away from is pain. Is that the Bible does not promise a pain-free life. Our Savior Jesus did not live a happy life. Jesus was not a happy person, and Jesus did not live a happy life. He was a joyful person because it was all about what he had on the inside, not about what was going on around us. And I think a lot of times I see believers that we go through this life and we think that we're promised the absence of pain when in reality that's, what, that's not what the Bible says. Matter of fact, that when we follow God, you're promised a lot more pain following God than if you did not follow God. Because... The enemy brings things into your life. So one thing we have to acknowledge from the beginning is not the absence of pain, but the presence of pain. Is but but why does God allow pain? That God's provision in our paths to purpose do include pain. Is that the Bible's clear about this? Things we don't understand, things we don't want to walk through. And it's used because pain is the one thing that takes us, as the Bible says, a wandering sheep meaning that we jump into so many different things, is that pain is the one thing that grabs us. That God will use to grab us so that pain puts him in the right perspective. Is that simply put, and this is why you always hear a believer talking about coming to God, and 99.9% .9 of the stories are uh, pain. You know, this happened in my life, or this happened in my life, or this happened... And why is it that it's always... Because God knows that that's the one thing that can grab us. Is that God knows that a moment of pain can produce so much more. But He will allow moments of pain to come into your life. Not just...
before salvation but after salvation. And why is it? Because pain puts him in the right perspective. It comes in and it tills up the heart and it keeps the heart soft and it keeps us looking to him. And that in this time that God actually draws so near to us in this time that the Bible actually promises, though, is that those moments and those seasons of pain is what produces in us what God wants in our lives. And it's actually what leads us is that the context of growth always happens around pain. Is that you don't grow without pain. And God realizes this. And that's why if somebody's comfortable and if somebody's always living that way, it may be, but what you never see is his growth. Because God knows that in the context of pain, you'll grow. Why do you grow? Because you simply look to him more than you would if you didn't have the pain. Because if we're honest about what led us to church, what led us to Jesus, what led us here, anything, 99.9% of us, it's going to be a story of pain. Because God knew I'm going to allow this. Right? Not I'm going to cause this, but I'm going to allow this. Why? Because it grabs that wandering sheep. It causes them to consider their path, and you turn to his path instead. That pain is used to put God in the right perspective. Right? And that's, that's why we look at that in this life, as James 1, 2, and as Romans 5, 3 through 5 lays out, is that seasons of pain happen for believers, not to believers. Is that the painful thing that God has allowed to walk into your life actually is promised at the end of it and when it's had its full effect to work for you and not just to you. It's that it produces inside of you. It's that the soul for growth is pain. And so we can look at that tonight. The verse says that he makes me lie down in green pastures. And so what it means is like if he makes me lie down, I have to understand that if he's making me lie down in green pastures, it's probably because I don't want to lie down there. And so in this life, it, we have to realize that if you live life for any time, I bet you've realized this about yourself, is that you want to journey to different pastures and wrong pastures. It's you're seeking to feed and to get something out of this life, but where you travel to in this life and where God wants you normally are not the same place. Because a lot of times we don't see the places and the things that God is going to use to grow us. We don't want them. We run from our seasons. We don't want to be single, right? We don't want to be at this place. We want to, we want to always be moving on to the next thing. But we run and we try before this season has its full effect. And we try to get out of it. We try to go to a different pasture. And God makes us lie down in green pasture. That is, that is a verb. That is him not just asking, but allowing something to come that sets you down. But where is it that he sets you down? It's in a green pasture. Where does a sheep really want to be? In a green pasture. It's just too stupid to realize that's where it needs to be. And if we're honest about us in our lives and we look back on the way we lived and what we did, we would see that the way God was calling us would be best. It's just we didn't see it as a green pasture. We were looking at another pastor. But we see that when we try and journey there is that God will use that to bring us back, right? But the beauty behind this is, is that God will use your most painful nights and most painful seasons to actually when it's produced and done what it's meant to be, you'll look back on them and be more thankful for them than anything else. I think back on my life and in my you know, short walk of faith that I've had with Jesus, is that the nights I think back to that kind of have become pillars and standards for my faith started with pain. But because God allowed it to have its full work, what it produced for me, not just to me, it worked for me, I'm thankful for it. And so that's what we see is that God will allow things to happen around us so that it causes us to look at Him inside of us. And so... We see this. This this doesn't really earthly logic doesn't really have a problem with this, right? I was thinking. I know this is silly, but I remember getting a getting a shot as a kid, right? Getting vaccinated, and all I thought about was how painful this was. I was crying. I was like, it's been a you know, it's been a while. It's been a couple months, <laughs> and you know, and y'all didn't laugh at that. 
But it's like, and I, I remember thinking, though, of only about the pain in which this was causing. But as we know, that it was for my good as a child to have this. But that's the same thing in our spiritual lives, is that we just look at the pain of what it's causing, not what it's producing. And we look at the pain and we wonder, God, why did you put me here? And that God just says back, this is for your good. And you don't realize it right now, but in hindsight, you will. And that's why we're called to walk by faith and not by sight. Because sight says something different about my season than my faith does. Because if I look with my sight at where God has me, sometimes it doesn't look the best. But when I look with the eyes of faith and I believe that God can do something inside this season, you see this season work for you and not just to you. And so it's this beautiful thing that God is... Uh, God's allowing that the painful moments of our stories are the powerful moments of our stories. And we see that even in David running in the wilderness, is that David's running, but God's preparing. Is that where David never wanted to be is the very season and the very place that would set up for him to be king. He just didn't know it at the time. He, was, he wasn't focused on it the right way. And that's the same promise for us in this life. Is that pain prepares us for our purpose. Is that David didn't understand what was going on. David didn't understand this is going to happen and this is going to cause this and this guy's going to do this and I'll be king. No, he just said, I don't know what's going on, but you're just calling me to rest. That your plan will come to pass. And so I'm going to sit at your table and I'm going to be fed. I'm going to rest. I'm going to grow. Is that instead of striving, I'm going to be satisfied, God, in who you are. And I'm not going to run out of this season. Is that I'm going to look at it in life's pain. We look to God's hand. When God says, I want you to look at my heart. Because you won't always understand God's hand. You will not understand what God allows in your life. 99.9% of the time, what you're thankful for and what you say, okay, that was my good. Six months ago, you're saying, this is for my bad. Like, and so that's what, is that faith's greatest question in our pain is, is knowing to look at the why instead of the what. Is that faith asks why instead of what. Faith doesn't look at just what I'm seeing. What, I hate my job. What, I, I, I hate this. No, it, instead it looks at why. Okay, God, why am I here? Why did you stop this? Why did you not allow this? And that faith asks is why instead of just looking at what. And that's how we're called to look at this. God says you will not always understand my hand. I want you instead to look at my heart. And that you're, when you understand God's heart, you understand his hand. How do you do that? Get to know it. Spend time with it. Is that we're in a relationship. We have to realize, I remember when this happened to me, is that biblical terms is, is when we come to know God as Savior, we're married to him. And I, I know it sounds maybe a little bit goofy, but I, I remember it hit me one time. I was at a funeral. I was looking at a dead body. And it really hit me is that I'm apparently married to someone I know very little about. And God was using that in that moment. This guy uh, served God and was an amazing guy and then died. Uh, when I seen him the day before, healthy as can be, died the next day. And I said, what? Is my life guaranteed? No. And so God, why did you do this? And we don't know all of these things, but what God's saying is, I want you to know who I am, not just what I do. And that we need to journey into that. And so David didn't understand what he was going through, but he trusted God and he leaned on him. Right? And that we see this in, in some psalms that, that a lot of times we say that because of maybe, and God's so amazing that he'll take the mistakes we did and allow them to work for us. That God, but there's so many times where we say, God, I, don't, I just really don't believe you can do this. This is, this is too much. I've screwed up too much. I've messed up too much. I've had that moment many times where I'm like, God, uh, you know, I, I can trust you back then, but not with this. And Psalms 139, 16 through 18 says this. Your eyes saw my, and this is David writing, your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. 
If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. And Job 42, 2 says this. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Is that God already saw everything you're going to do from the beginning. God's never been surprised a day in his life, I promise you that. And that when we say, God, you can't do this, is God, the Bible clearly says, hey, I knew about this billions of years ago. I knew about this before time even began. And I still chose to create you. And so his purpose will come to pass, as this says, that God's purpose for your life is not this ongoing story that you better just hope you don't screw up and tomorrow you ruin everything. No. It's that God says, I know everything. That I have my plan for your life. And Isaiah says that my word will not return to me void. Meaning what I speak over your life will come to pass. And it will not, it's not up to, you can't screw up enough to where God's plan. You've never beat up God's plan. God's never been beat up. He's never has. And so that we can rest in that, in that Psalms 119.71. seventy-one says this, It is good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your uh, statutes. That, that promises that in the seasons in which we hurt the most, God does the most. When we look to Him and when we rest in Him that our pain is producing something not just to us but for us. To where we can rest in that. And the interesting scripture is Hebrews. Is that this verse in Hebrews really surprised me. In the days of His flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. In verse 9, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus Christ learned and became who he was meant to be. Why? Because of what he suffered. The same thing will come to true in your life. Is that it's actually in the pain you grow the most. And that's why the seasons of pain in your life are just as valuable as any other season. Because that's when you truly learn who God is. Right? And so a strong faith is built by deep pain. Is that you never encounter somebody in this life who has a strong faith life. I promise you, ask them what they've been through. And you'll see a life marked by pain, marked by tears. Is that Jesus was a man of many sorrows, a man well acquainted with grief, a man of sorrow, as the Bible says. And that the Bible also says a servant is not above his master. Our master is Jesus. If his life was marked by grief and sorrow, we have to realize our life will be too. Is that this is not when we follow God the absence of pain, but the presence of it. But God says, I'll use the pain, and there will be moments of joy, but I promise I'll use the pain to build joy inside of you to where you can rejoice in your suffering. Is that that's when you learn God the most. And so when we lean into Him. And so God's thing that's meant to uh, provide for us and to give us that inner stability inside of us the second thing of why we're going through pain, what does God cause to really steady your soul is, is peace. Is that God offers that inside your pain what will steady your feet or what will steady your soul and make you able not to just survive but to thrive and to grow in your season will be his peace. That when you come to his table, you see it and you realize that the person that is over you and in control is deeply in love with you. And so he does everything working for you, not just to you. And so when we rest in this, that the greatest struggle in this life, though, that you'll find it with your heart is uh, keeping God first, is staying in love with God. Is that there will be things that the enemy comes and what its number one goal is, is to take away the first love and to take God off of the throne of your heart. What does that mean? Is that practically there will be relationships, there will be 
things that come to distract you and they pull you away from God and then you see at the very end of it what it's produced inside your life of when you walk away from God and you see that there, that its number one goal was to pull you from God. So your greatest struggle and the greatest battle of your heart that you'll ever encounter is keeping it fulfilled by God. Is that that's the battleground of your heart. And so we are meant to be at peace. And the beautiful thing about this is when we become a people at peace and when we have a source of peace is that we show up to people not looking to take to them but in everything to give to them. Is that we show up to people not as syringes and not trying to take from them, but rather freely to give to them. And this is what God says I want my people to be known as, is I take care of you. Is that your heart is filled by me. And so you don't show up to that relationship for fulfillment. You don't show up to that friendship or that college or that whatever it may be. There's so many different things. But you don't show up there to find life's meaning. That we don't work for anything, but the people of God are meant to come from everything. Is that to where when you have a source, is that it's not dependent on anybody except for Jesus. And so we're called to rest in that. And that in this life that the creator of life is meant to sustain our life. And so we seek other things to fill us, but only he can fulfill us, right? To where not just to fill our cups, but to make it overflow. And what happens when you stand to a uh, next to a cup that's overflowing is naturally you're going to get splashed on. And this is what the people of God is supposed to be known for, is that when people come in contact with you, what you have on the inside of you is meant to be welling up so much that they can't help but get hit by it. Because they come in contact with you, your cup's overflowing, it splashes over, and simply, it's meant to splash onto them. And what is that? Love, peace, joy. Is that the world supposed to look at you and say, you look a lot different. Why? Because they come in contact with you. This is why people say, you know, like, I just really enjoy being around that guy. And what they don't realize is, is the reason of that being is that you have something they don't have. And so, at the table when when we journey for, uh, through life and we're fulfilled is that we're meant to be a people of blessing that we can not just use it but we can look to other people's needs because we know our needs will be taken care of and so the people of God are meant to be known as those people marked by their love for other people right to where we're so satisfied in Him that we're meant to look different. And so we strive in life for other things because we're not satisfied in life in God. So the moment that your heart is striving for something, you know, I just really want a relationship, I just really want this, I just really want this, is really check your heart because what you are is you're striving because you're not satisfied. And God says that's a healthy desire, but when you think you need it, it's dangerous. Because I'm supposed to be the one that takes complete control of you. And takes complete care of you. Because only I can give you what you see. And so it's okay to have those desires. To want to be married. To be in a relationship. Those are godly things. The difference is though in that desire to look at. As not just a want but a need. Because then my life has no meaning. I need your love to give my life meaning. My life has no, no peace. So I need to rest in you. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm loved, so I need your love to supply that. And it's too much weight to put on somebody else. And so we see that we combat these things and we defeat these things by realizing that our lives are in the hand of a wise, loving Father who is doing everything not just to work to us, but to work for us and to work in us. And so God says, I'll completely take care of you in these things. Is that Tim Keller says this, is that when we see God for the loving, perfect Father He is, we learn to trust whatever He gives us is what we need. Is that this season is truly for our good, no matter if we understand how or why. Is that when you learn to, and you see who God truly is, you don't question what He does, because you know it comes from the heart of somebody who loves you. 
So you don't question this season. You don't question why this had to go this way. Instead, you look and you trust him who's working this. And so lastly is that we see that through the pain we have peace, but also what we're seeing that provides for us. And this may be something that you didn't really think we would go in this direction, but what David's about to see in this life uh, in 1 Samuel 22, 1 through 3 says this. This is David on the run. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Abdullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. And he said to the king, please let my father and my mother stay with you. So I know what God will do for me. So he sees that David's on the run. He goes and hides out in a cave. And he's hanging out there. Some people come to him, about 400 of them, right? And the Bible's very clear, not good people, bad people. It's that they were running, they were debtors, they were criminals, they were bad people. And they came to this cave to hang out as well. And David, because he is naturally just a king, he becomes commander over them, right? These 400 people would later in the Bible go by a different name. These 400 people would later become David's mighty men. And so you read in Chronicles and so on in the Bible, why is this important? Is that where he thought he was running to, or he thought he was running from, he was actually running to. Is that God had something in this life that we all need to realize that God is, has in our season. And it's really the most important thing in our season outside of God himself. And it's our people. It's the people that we have around us. It's these people that we have with us. It's that these mighty men would be the ones who slayed David's enemies and who put him on the throne. And so we see that in a season where David didn't understand and he thought he was running from, actually God used it to where he ran to the very thing he needed. And what David didn't even realize he needed and what we don't realize we need is our people. Is that the people around us. You see, people are God's most beloved and most prized uh, creation. Is that the best thing God ever did, the most magnificent thing that God has ever created is you. Is that God's most prized possession is his people. And in this life, when we meet, what we never realize is, is that in these seasons, if you look back in those painful seasons, there was always somebody there, right? There was always that person that you met that God used so much. Why? Because God always works his purpose through people. That's how God works, right? The most amazing thing is that if we're honest, what brought you here to this family just like myself, my story was I was just in pain, and I just needed a place to go, and upper room became that. And that's probably the same story for everybody sitting in this room, is that God will use pain to lead you to peace, but then to lead you to his people, because God always works through people, because it's his most beloved creation. He came to die for the people. Because he wanted them back because it was his most magnificent creation. And so what we see here is that one of the greatest things you have and you need in your season of pain that you may not realize it is the people around you. Is us. This is what is one of the most powerful things that God will give you. Right? Is a brother to call on the phone when a day is going uh, when the day's tough, a sister to hang out with when you just really need somebody to hang out with, somebody to talk to, a close friend with an open ear to go eat Huddle House with you, right? <laughs> Holding ground and to see God move through Huddle House. And uh, no, but what we see here is that in your season of pain, God will always lead you to the people. I remember a painful moment for me. I was praying. 
I was crying. I was like, God, what is this doing? And God spoke so clearly and said, in this season, I'm going to show you who your true friends are. Because that's one of the most valuable things. We never think about that. But it's the people around us that are one of the greatest gifts inside of our lives. Right? Because God works through people. He loves his people. We're meant to love people. Is that you, you're meant to see in everybody. I remember I was eating lunch with this guy one time. And uh, this guy was incredibly socially awkward. There's no other way of putting that. He was not a good conversation keeper. You know, it was, uh, it, was, it was quite hard. And I remember in that moment thinking, I was down at JSU, and I was like, man, I just, I can go over to Dustin's house and hang out with people I know better, and it would be a lot better conversation. This is kind of awkward. And all of a sudden, it hit me so clear as I looked at it. And God just spoke so clearly to me that you're supposed to look at him not as he is, but the potential of who he could be in me. And so we as a people are meant to see potential in people, right? The most broken thing on this planet now, the most broken, horrible thing on this planet now is people outside of God. The most beautiful thing on this planet is people inside of God. It's that we are the true example of broken, but also beautiful, is that before Jesus, we were the worst. We were the broken. We had no value. We were sinful, wretched, and horrible people. But God saw potential in us, not of what we were, but of who we could be inside of Him. And we're called to look at people and not to see them as what they do and who they are, but who they can be in Jesus. And we're supposed to love and empower them to be that, to lead them to Jesus, knowing that inside of Jesus you could be something you never thought. I really thought about this guy. Like if he could find who he is inside of Christ, that identity that rests inside of all of us, it would start to bud and it would start to come out. And when you see somebody truly transformed by Jesus and living in, in who they are, one of the most beautiful things is that you see a person's true personality come out. It's the identity that God planted inside of them grows as they spend time with God. And as they spend time with God, they find out who they are as well as who He is. And it's a beautiful thing to see somebody so free because they have identity. And it's a beautiful thing. And that's how we look at people. Is we're supposed to look at them and not just see them as the, the awkward, the the mean, the whatever it is, but to look at it with the love, that same love that Christ looked on you when you did not deserve it. You were not a pretty picture. But God chose to look at you with that love and we're called to do the same thing. And that inside our seasons of pain is that God will give us peace to sustain us and people around us to help us. And that you're meant to build community and build relationships. So to just end with uh, two stories of where I saw this kind of come to pass in my life is um, I met a guy I was serving at a uh, I was serving here at a marriage conference uh, two years ago and uh, I met this guy and didn't think much about it and um, we just talked a little bit and uh, he asked me if I would like to go out to eat with him and I said sure and so we went out to eat together and as we talked that night uh he shared his story with me, and, and uh, we had been through some very similar things, and, and, it, and we started from that moment. I never realized it, but in that season is that we started one of the most, uh, one of the best friendships I've ever had, is that I met this guy, and, we, uh, and I thought that God in this season was using me uh, to to work for him, to do things in his life, and that that's what I was called to do. What I didn't realize, though, is as God used me in his life and to speak into his life, is what I didn't realize, though, is that there would be a situation later um, in life, about six months later, of a really painful situation that I would walk through. And um, after I, while I was walking through it, is that he was the uh, he was the one person that came and visited me in that time, and I remember uh, as I was just crying, he just gave me a hug, 
And I realized in that moment that God will use those use us to pour into people, and then the beautiful thing is He'll use those people to pour into us. And that where I poured into Him, now my job was to be poured into by Him. And so what you see is, is God brought peace into my life, and how did he bring it? Through people. God works through his people. And so you need to find who are those people, who are those mighty men, those mighty women uh, for your life. Is that for real? Because you find your purpose in your people. You really do. Your life takes on a different measure when you know the people, the community, and the family that God has for you. And as you pour into those relationships, you see so much beauty. And so we can rest tonight that as we go into worship, that in this life we will encounter pain. And some of the wisest things you can do while you're in pain is realize you're in pain. Some of the best things you can do is allow yourself to weep. Is allow yourself to cry while you're in pain. It's not to hold it back, not to push it away. It's that God gave you emotions for a reason. It's that sometimes while you're in pain, what you truly do need to do is realize you're in pain. Realize the pain that is inside your heart and to weep. Jesus cried a lot. And so stuffing it down, pushing on and soldiering on is not the answer is that there's painful situations that you need to realize that you're in. And not to push them away, but rather to push into them to see God in them. Is that, I know that sounds weird, and that's not really something you hear a lot, but one of the best things you can do is weep. One of the best things you can do <coughs> is allow yourself to feel that emotion and to process that. Don't stuff it down, but to let it come out and let, and let it be brought to the light. Let that darkness be brought to the light. And that God can bring peace inside that pain. And then to find your people while you're in that pain to help you through this life of the family around you that God has. And to start sowing into that. Okay, I'm going to call that person. I'm going to talk to that person. I'm going to start hanging out. I don't do well while I'm by myself because I'm not meant to be. Because I'm going to use this family and these people that God has in me. And I'm going to see them become what they're meant to be in my life. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much, God, for tonight. Father, I pray that no matter the pain and no matter the heartache, God, and the real things that we do walk through in this life, God, the broken situations, that, God, we're not ignorant of them. We don't push it down and call it faith or call it courage. But rather, you don't call us to do that, God. You simply call us to carry them into your presence. That our pain is meant to be processed by your presence. Father, and I just pray that whatever we're going through, we don't run away from that, God, but we run into it to see you, God, in that pain. Because that's where you're present. You're in the pain. Father, and I pray that with peace, God, that you'll work that inside of our hearts. But for some of us, that only comes when through your people. God, so I pray that with upper room and people in upper room and, and wherever that may be, Father, I pray that we can seek from you, God, and to realize that the source in which you work through to bring the peace inside the pain may be people. And I pray, God, that we can build those friendships and those amazing relationships, God, that you have for us in community. And so, Jesus, I pray that we can just carry this and carry all these things into your presence tonight as we look to you, as we worship, and as we fellowship with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship.